Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Clinical and Laboratory Studies of Zika Virus Infection, presented by Dr. Charles Chu, Associate Professor of Laboratory Medicine and Medicine Infectious Diseases Director, UCSF Abbott Viral Diagnostics and Discovery Center Associate Director, UCSF School of Medicine. We are excited to bring you this educational webcast presented by LabRoots the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. I'm Julie Simaroth of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credit. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your web page and follow the process of obtaining your credit. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Charles Chu. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you, Julie, and hello, everyone. I'd like to talk to you today about clinical and laboratory studies of Zika virus infection. Uh, Zika virus is a very broad topic, and I will be focused today on describing studies of Zika virus infection that are being done in my laboratory and uh, with collaborators. I'd like to begin with some disclosures. I do get research support for pathogen discovery from Abbott Diagnostics and research support for nanopore assay development by BioMariU. So the summary of my talk, we'll start by talking about Zika virus. Um, I'll provide an introduction to the virus, and we'll also uh, describe uh, and give you some information on why it is considered a significant human pathogen, and truly an emerging pathogen that only recently uh, we've begun to appreciate. Um, I'll then describe uh, some in vitro cell culture studies of Zika virus infection that are being done in my laboratory to better understand how Zika virus grows in cells, how it infects human cells, and how it causes disease. Uh, we'll then move into a description of some animal models of Zika virus infection. Specifically, we'll be talking about a non-human primate marmoset monkey model of Zika virus infection, and how uh, using this model can help us better understand um, how Zika virus causes disease and, and also um, perhaps the development of uh, a model that could be used for vaccine and drug development. And finally, we'll talk about clinical and epidemiological studies of Zika virus infection using a novel technique called metagenomics. Um, a way to broadly analyze clinical samples for really evidence of any, any kind of infection, whether it's a virus, a bacterium, a fungus, or a parasite, and using Zika virus infection as a model. Uh, we'll talk about specifically how these technologies um, are being deployed in the developing world and how we could use it potentially in the future um, as a way to address uh, emerging outbreaks from, from pathogens such as Zika virus. So let's start out by talking about Zika virus. Uh, what is it? Well, this is a virus in the family Flaviviridae, in the genus Flavivirus. It is a Flavivirus. Um, other members of the Flavivirus genus include West Nile virus, Japanese encephalitis virus, St. Louis encephalitis virus, a dengue virus, and yellow fever virus. These are all enveloped, single-stranded RNA viruses. Uh, many have been associated with human disease. And uh, certainly, um, they, uh, they have also been uh, described as, um, as infecting a wide variety of different animals, um, including vertebrates uh, such as humans, um, as well as invertebrates uh, such as mosquitoes. Um, in particular, many of these viruses are known as vector-borne pathogens. 
uh, meaning that uh, you acquire infection or you as a person could be infected by exposure to, say, a mosquito bite or uh, a bite of another arthropod such as a tick. What you see in the lower left-hand corner um, is actually an, an electron micrograph, uh, and this was provided by the CDC, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, which actually shows you uh, viral particles infecting a human cell. So the clinical presentation of acute Zika virus infection is, is, is um, quite interesting. Um, over 80% of these infections are thought to be asymptomatic. And what that means is um, after a person gets bitten by a mosquito and gets Zika virus infection, um, the person may uh, not exhibit any symptoms. Uh, now, in the roughly 20% of cases where a patient is or a person is, infected person is symptomatic, what you can see are a variety of different uh, clinical syndromes that resemble an acute febrile illness. Uh, they include fever, rash, headache, joint pain, conjunctivitis or red eyes, and muscle pain. Uh, laboratory findings from in a, patients acutely infected with Zika virus are usually normal, although in some cases you can see leukopenia, which is a low white blood cell count, thrombocytopenia, a low platelet count, or mild elevation in liver enzymes, uh, maybe a mild acute hepatitis. However, recently it has been described uh, severe consequences of Zika virus infection. In particular, during pregnancy um, in an infected pregnant woman, Zika virus infection and during any time in her pregnancy has been associated with what a phenomenon called microcephaly. Now, this is a severe brain uh, developmental defect that can occur in babies uh, of uh, pregnant women who are infected with Zika virus infection, and which we'll describe in, in more detail in later slides. Um, another consequence of Zika virus infection is the neurological consequence is that some patients uh, who are infected with Zika virus can develop a severe neurological illness called Guillain-Barre syndrome. And this is a paralytic illness um, in which uh, there can be slow uh, kind of neurodegeneration. Uh, it's an auto, thought to be an autoimmune disease where you develop antibodies against, um, against your neural cells resulting in neurological disease and, and in some cases, paralysis. Uh, so this is a severe consequence that can occur in patients or in individuals who are infected with Zika virus. But notably, Zika virus infection is uh, the common febrile uh, associated or fever associated symptoms that you get uh, mean, means that the, these in, the Zika virus infection can be clinically indistinguishable from other mosquito-borne infections. Uh, for instance, West Nile virus infection or dengue virus infection, these are both flaviviruses also spread by mosquitoes, uh, can essentially mimic Zika virus infection. And this poses a diagnostic challenge for clinicians who are trying to accurately diagnose and screen for Zika virus infection in their patients. So where has Zika virus been found? Well, Zika virus was first identified in Zika forest in Uganda, Africa in 1947. Uh, from there, um, it, it, has been, uh, it, is, it has been described in the late 70s in, in parts of Southeast Asia and Asia, including uh, Pakistan, Malaysia, and Indonesia. In 2007, uh, there was actually a huge outbreak of Zika virus infection in Micronesia in, Yap, in the Yap Island complex in the Pacific Ocean. And in 2013, it actually spread to French Polynesia. Um, probably it received kind of the most notice in 2014 when there was a huge outbreak of Zika virus infections in Brazil. And concordant with that, or at, at the time of the outbreak, was, um, was also noted uh, an increase in number of cases of microcephaly in pregnant women uh, from Brazil who were infected with Zika virus. Um, in general, before 2015, Zika, virus, Zika outbreaks really occurred on a sporadic basis, um, although currently outbreaks and cases of Zika virus have been described worldwide. Uh, now, this is a virus that, because it's spread by uh, mosquitoes, in particular the Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus mosquitoes, um, it's a virus that's predominantly confined to tropical regions of the world. Uh, uh, near the equator or in some cases um, uh, farther away from the equator. Um, and as you can see in the, in the uh, graph, uh, in the plot below, in the map below, in the map in the slide, you can see that in, 
in purple are highlighted areas where Zika virus cases have been described um, by the CDC. And Zika has received kind of local interest in the United States uh, because there have been uh, evidence of local mosquito-borne spread of Zika virus. Now, this is described as autochthonous cases of Zika virus, meaning that Zika virus cases that were obtained uh, locally um, in your native country. This is as opposed to more common cases of Zika virus diagnosed in the United States, which come from uh, exposure outside of the United States, where um, as a returning traveler, you get infected outside the United States and then come back to the United States um, uh, if you uh, are screened for uh, symptoms or if you test positive for Zika virus. Um, it has been described so far, local spread of Zika virus has been described really in two regions of the United States. They include Miami-Dade County in Florida and Brownsville, Texas. Um, and as a result of these local cases of mosquito-borne spread, uh, the CDC had recommended that uh, pregnant women postpone or um, cancel travel to these affected areas. Uh, now, currently, as of June 2nd, 2017, the CDC has actually lifted the yellow area designation for uh, travel, uh, travel restrictions for pregnant women for Miami-Dade County because it's been thought that the Zika virus uh, infected mosquitoes have been eradicated from that county. Um, however, uh, there still is a recommendation that pregnant women avoid travel to Brownsville, Texas. Um, this is uh, a slide that shows you uh, the kind of the mosquito, the Aedes aegypti mosquito that has been most commonly associated with Zika transmission. This is a virus that is spread most commonly through mosquito bites. Um, however, um, it also has been described uh, vertical transmission of Zika virus from a pregnant woman to her fetus, um, in some cases resulting in kind of uh, severe neurological consequences such as microcephaly. Um, it, Sexual transmission of Zika virus has also been described, uh, both male to female and female to male, uh, through sexual contact. Um, and this is rather an, uh, kind of an unusual phenomenon because it has not really been described for other flaviviruses. It really has only been described for Zika virus. And there have been some rare cases of laboratory exposure uh, by working with Zika virus infected materials. Uh, Zika has also been shown to be spread through blood transfusion. Um, um, however, there have been no reports of infants who, are, who have gotten Zika virus through breastfeeding. This slide gives you an example of congenital Zika syndrome. Um, and this is uh, probably the most striking and uh, perhaps uh, a severe manifestation of Zika virus infection. Uh, this is due to vertical transmission of the virus from an infected pregnant mom to the fetus. Um, and it has been linked to, um, Zika virus infection has been linked to abnormalities in brain development. The most prominent is microcephaly, where you can see that babies are born with uh, abnormally small heads. But in addition to that, um, this is, it's not just the size of the head, but it also, it's, it represents a um, developmental delay in general of neural development. Uh, so uh, many of these babies uh, are, are born, for instance, with severe uh, developmental disability. Um, and only now are we uh, starting to appreciate kind of the long-term consequences as these babies grow older um, of, of having microcephaly. Um, the uh, con what the uh, congenital consequences of Zika virus or potential consequences of Zika virus infection, otherwise known as congenital Zika syndrome, has also been associated with miscarriages and stillbirths um, in infected uh, women who are um, pregnant women who are infected with Zika virus. The Zika virus in adults has also been associated with a severe neurological illness called Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now, this is an uncommon autoimmune disease of the nervous system, resulting in damage to nerve cells, uh, resulting in muscle weakness and potentially paralysis. Um, in some cases, the paralysis, which usually begins uh, in the arms and the legs peripherally, can become so severe that uh, patients will be unable to breathe on their own, and they would require a ventilator. Uh, in most cases, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, is reversible um, um, with, uh, and the treatment is mainly supportive, um, although in some cases uh, there have been uh, long-term um, effects from uh, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, in some cases deaths as well. Uh, now, Guillain-Barre syndrome has been strongly associated with Zika virus infection in both children and adults, 
Although similar to congenital Zika virus syndrome, it's unknown what proportion of people who are infected with Zika virus actually get Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, and the CDC is continuing, the United States uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is continuing to investigate the link between Guillain-Barre syndrome and Zika to learn more about this syndrome and association with Zika virus infection. Now, Zika virus diagnostic testing um, is, is typically there are, there are two uh, main tests. Um, uh, culturing for the virus in which you try to grow the virus is generally not used clinically, so I won't talk uh, any more about that. Um, there is an acute phase of the virus, which of, of the infection, meaning less than or equal to one week after the initial mosquito bite or uh, acquisition of the disease. Um, in this case, um, it, it, it is possible that you can detect Zika virus by doing polymerase chain reaction testing, specifically looking for viral nucleic acid or viral RNA in blood, saliva, or urine. Um, the uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, ha has a Zika virus assay that actually consists of two PCR reactions. Um, and they also have uh, what's known as a trioplex PCR assay, which can detect three different arboviruses or arthropod-borne viruses simultaneously, Zika, chingunya, and dengue virus. Um, now, um, after uh, two weeks, however, um, the, the virus is typically not detectable in blood or in other uh, bodily fluids by the use of PCR testing. So in that case, we have to resort to a test uh, called uh, an, an antibody or serological test. Specifically, we look for IgM antibody to Zika virus. Um, this has been uh, problematic, a little problematic, given that the antibody test has cross-reactivity with other flaviviruses, including yellow fever virus, West Nile virus, and dengue virus. In other words, what this means is that you can have a positive test for a serological test for Zika virus, but it may not be specific for Zika virus. Uh, it may simply reflect that uh, perhaps a prior or recent exposure to dengue virus, for instance. Um, and because it lacks specificity, uh, this really poses a kind of an ongoing challenge for how do we actually develop diagnostic tests for Zika virus that are both sensitive and specific. Uh, there is a confirmatory test called the plaque reduction neutralization test for Zika, which is called PRINT. This is also an antibody test, intensely more specific, and yet it still has cross-reactivity with these other flaviviruses. So I'm going to go into kind of the research that we're currently doing in the laboratory to sort of answer some key questions involving Zika virus. We want to answer uh, the following five questions. First. Uh, we want to potentially answer uh, the question of, does Zika virus infect mature brain neurons and spinal cord cells? You know, as I previously mentioned, one of the consequences of Zika virus infection in adults is, or potential consequences, is Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, this is a, a disease of spinal cord cells. Um, so what we want to see is, you know, answer is, is, does Zika virus directly infect spinal cord cells? And perhaps that might be a mechanism by which uh, it may result in Guillain-Barre syndrome. Or is Guillain-Barre syndrome really an autoimmune or an antibody response to the infection, and whereas uh, where Zika virus is not directly infecting those cells? Similarly, we want to know whether or not Zika virus infects mature brain neurons. Um, and this is important, and what, what, what I define as mature as differentiated brain neurons. Um, and this is important because of this association between Zika virus infection and fetal uh, neurological defects such as microcephaly. Uh, we, we already know that um, uh, that uh, Zika virus, d data from other groups has already shown that, that Zika virus can infect, for instance, uh, fetal or developing neurons. But can Zika virus also infect kind of mature neurons? So that's a key question that we'd like to answer. Uh, we're also interested in answering the question of can we develop a non-human primate or a monkey model of Zika virus that replicates the human disease. And the purpose of developing a, a non-human primate model is that we could potentially use this to better understand how Zika virus causes microcephaly. Uh, and, uh, and potentially better, better uh, uh, this could spur the development of effective drugs and vaccines that could be tested uh, in this non-human primate model that could be used to prevent uh, the consequences of Zika virus infection. Uh, we also want to do genetic or genomic studies of Zika virus. And the purpose of this is to uh, determine um, or assess how Zika virus is evolving and spreading in the Americas. And the fourth question is we want to see, is there a human gene signature for Zika virus 
that has diagnostic and or prognostic utility. Um, I previously mentioned one of the diagnostic dilemmas of Zika virus is that PCR testing, for instance, is only good or typically thought to be good within the first week or two, uh, whereas antibody or serological testing lacks specificity. Can we find potentially a human gene signature that will allow us to diagnose Zika virus within the window period, uh, the period of time where both PCR and serology is not very useful in diagnosing the disease? And this uh, is one of the kind of key uh, challenges that are facing um, uh, those of us who are working on Zika virus diagnostics. And then finally, um, using Zika virus as an example of an outbreak pathogen, can we develop rapid diagnostic tests for Zika virus and other fever-associated illnesses that can be used in the field? Can we develop a test, for instance, that we could bring to Africa, that we could bring to Brazil, or that we could bring to other areas around the world to be able to do testing, not only for Zika virus, but really to be able to do differential diagnosis of all febrile infections, especially those that are caused by, um, that are vector-borne, caused by uh, bites of mosquitoes and ticks. So I'll, I'll talk first about Zika virus infection of differentiated or mature neurons. Um, and I'd like to highlight uh, that this work was done primarily by Dr. Claudia Sanchez Martin in my laboratory, who is a, a PhD uh, researcher. Um, and uh, the premise behind the, these studies are that we really need to understand in vitro cell culture models to better study Zika virus pathogenesis and also to understand you know, how Zika virus infects cells and the spectrum of Zika virus infection. Uh, what you actually see in this image here is uh, this is actually an electron micrograph of Zika virus infecting a human neural cell line, which I'll go into shortly, um, and where you see kind of the dark particles, which I'll actually show you here. You can see here basically uh, a focus on dark particles, and each of those particles is a particle of, of Zika virus. And I, I want to say that we're not the only ones that are working, obviously, on Zika virus. There have been a huge number of papers that have come out in recent, uh, in, in over the past year, uh, specifically looking at Zika virus infection of different uh, neural cells. Uh, we're, we've chosen to focus specifically on mature differentiated neurons and spinal cord cells, uh, of which there's much less data that's been available, that's available in the literature. So this is kind of the study design. What we do is we actually plate cells, and these cells are uh, neurological cells, neuroblastoma cells, in the cell line SH-SY5Y. Uh, these are neuroblastoma cells, so they're adult uh, tumor cells uh, that have been immortalized and cultured in, in, and basically propagated in cell lines. What we do is we plate these cells, um, and then we um, infect, we use the virus to infect these cells. We first start out by infecting uh, undifferentiated cells, meaning that cells have not been differentiated into mature neurons, and then we infect differentiated cells. Um, one uh, possibility, uh, what we did then do is we actually collect the cells, and we do one uh, test that we do is called quantitative RT-PCR. We actually look for levels of the virus as it grows inside of these cells, and hopefully what we, you would expect to see is you would expect to see an increase in QRT-PCR viral loads over time as the virus grows and infects these cells. And then we also do a plaque assay. Uh, we also uh, collect these samples uh, for doing uh, staining so that we can see, for instance, uh, directly visualize the cells growing in cell culture. Um, so this is an example uh, of some of the results that we have from the study. Uh, what you actually see on the right uh, are panels of, of different cells. Um, so what you see, actually see on the upper row, on the top row, is a panel showing an undifferentiated cell line. Um, and uh, you see infection of, of an undifferentiated cell line with, uh, by inoculating um, the cell line with Zika virus. In the middle row is actually a differentiated cell line, which is basically a neurological, uh, basically a neuron that's mature. And then in the, in the bottom row, we actually see viral cells, which is a common uh, monkey cell line that's known to be infectable by uh, Zika virus. So this is actually a positive control. Um, in what you can see, uh, in all instances, if you look, if you focus on kind of the panel on the right, you can see that in, in areas marked red, that actually marks um, areas of cells that are infected with Zika virus. 
So what you can see is that there is some infection in undifferentiated cells. It's not that much, though. It appears that very a few of the cells are infected. However, once the cells differentiate or mature, uh, you can see that more cells are infected. Um, and so this is, is really uh, kind of, this data has really, really showed us that mature cells indeed, neuroblast neural cells, are indeed infectable by the virus. So we attempted to actually quantify in terms of what, how many of these cells are actually infected following Zika virus infection. Uh, so what you can see here is that with kind of an undifferentiated cells, and these are cells that are not yet mature, they've not differentiated yet, uh, you can see that very few of them are infected. However, once you differentiate them using either 2% uh, fetal bovine serum or this um, chemical called retinoic acid, where these both differentiate these cells, uh, you can see that you see much more infection, as shown by these graphs showing the percent of cells that are infected in terms of focus forming units, or FFU, as well as kind of the degree of kind of uh, green fluorescence that you can actually see by um, staining these cells. Correlating with the increases in infection, we also see increases in titer. So, so uh, along with the uh, kind of increased number of cells, we can also see an increase in the amount of virus that can actually be detected in supernatant from these cells. Um, and this is also additional evidence that shows that these cells are infected. Uh, we also did some experiments uh, showing, or studies showing, that various strains of Zika virus are infectious to these cell lines. So for instance, uh, the Uganda strain, which was the original 1947 strain of Zika virus, as well as the 2015 Puerto Rico strain, Malaysian strain, Cambodian strain, and probably the most recent 2016 Brazil strain, these, are, these viruses, are different strains of Zika virus, are all able to infect the neuroblastoma cell lines, or the mature differentiated neurons. And when we did uh, electron microscopy of these infected cells, we saw that the, you could actually visualize the particles. And the particles appear to accumulate in Golgi bodies. Uh, Golgi bodies are cell structural components where the proteins, uh, human proteins are processed, and also viral proteins tend to be processed. And we actually found that Zika virus appears to accumulate in these Golgi bodies and actually appears to distort the architecture of the Golgi bodies. Um, notably, this is also seen in other flaviviral infections, such as hepatitis C virus, uh, which, uh, um, which is also um, um, a, a, a other flaviviral infections, as well as uh, hepatitis C virus. I'd like to move into kind of a non-human primate or uh, a marmoset monkey model of Zika virus infection. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of the collaborators that we're working with on this. Uh, they include uh, the Texas Biomedical Health Research Institute uh, researchers, Drs. Jean Patterson, Suzette Tardif, and Luis Giavidoni, uh, Dr. Kirsty Agard at the Baylor College of Medicine, uh, Dr. Julian Rutherford at the University of Illinois, and my laboratory. So one common question is, why do we actually want to develop a new world monkey model of Zika virus infection? Um, I can tell you that many groups are working on different monkey models. Most of the focus on monkey models or non-human primate models of Zika virus infection have been with rhesus or old world monkey macaques. Um, so there are some advantages to using kind of marmosets. One is that uh, these new world monkeys are easier to house and handle because of their small size. Um, if you wanted to test, say, a novel vaccine or therapeutic, they may, there would be decreased volume requirements for doing so. Uh, they, they don't appear to harbor infectious disease agents that are transmissible to humans, like herpes virus B, which is spread by or is potentially transmissible from old world uh, monkeys. Um, the uh, marmoset monkeys can be maintained in natural social groupings. So you can study, for instance, uh, potentially studies of, say, sexual transmission of Zika virus. Um, and it's also been described by my collaborators that uh, marmoset monkeys are readily infected by a variety of human viral pathogens. Um, so, uh, and it's, uh, it's also the fact that these monkeys are endemic to affected areas of, say, Brazil and South America. So potentially they may constitute a reservoir for the virus in the wild. And finally, um, each pregnancy are typically multiple births. You can have dizygotic or twin births, or in some cases triplets or quadruplet births. 
um, in these monkeys, and it may make it easier to study, for instance, um, uh, Zika virus-induced uh, neural fetal defects. Some disadvantage, though, is that we have, it's less commonly used in the United States. There are very few um, institutions, such as the Texas Biomedical Research Institute, that have access to these monkeys for, uh, for research. And the small size of the monkeys limits the clinical sample volume and the scope of procedures that you can do. So this is the study collection protocol. What we do is we actually inoculate these marmoset monkeys with Zika virus, and we collect a variety of clinical samples, as you can see here, really to sort of understand um, you know, how does the virus infect these and how long does the virus persist in these body fluids following infection. We were able to show immediately that actually that this virus is infectious to marmoset monkeys, uh, which was not a guaranteed thing. Uh, it, it does, what you can see is in all of the uh, four monkeys that we uh, looked at, uh, the uh, monkey mounted a very strong antibody neutralizing antibody response to the virus. Um, and in fact, when we, we challenged the monkey with uh, or pre a previously inoculated monkey with another a dose of the of the virus, you actually saw that the antibodies, uh, the neutralizing antibody titer increased even more. So there was probably an enhancement by uh, rechallenging with uh, another um, dose of the virus. When we look at sort of the viral expression kind of in different tissues and bodily fluids from, from these monkeys, you can see that it does appear to, to persist about a week or so in serum, as you can see in the upper left corner, um, and then it does appear to persist longer, up to two weeks in urine and saliva, um, and then sporadically detected in feces and in semen and semen swabs. Uh, now this is, uh, what's interesting is that this actual um, these kinetics of the virus in, in different body fluids appears to mimic very well uh, what we had seen in humans. So in humans, for instance, typically you can find the virus in blood in the first week, but then you could probably it persists for longer periods of time in urine, saliva, and semen. Um, and it appears that this, this uh, particular monkey model is, um, is a, a good uh, mimic or replicate of what you might see in human infection. Uh, meaning that it might be a suitable model to use for studying human infection. Um, the other thing that's also uh, notable is that uh, all four of the monkeys who are not, which were inoculated, they did not develop any symptoms. And this is also in line with the fact that 80% of human infections of Zika virus are asymptomatic. Um, this is a view of some of the, using um, cytokine profiling, we're able to actually look at some of the some of the uh, proteins or cytokines that are expressed in response to Zika virus infection. Um, and uh, I don't want to go too much into this. I do, I do want to say that some interferon-associated genes are, do appear to be um, induced by Zika virus infection, such as interferon gamma and MIG. Uh, these uh, genes and cytokines have previously been described, actually, in the context of various viral infections. And what we can do is we could actually do what we call transcriptome analysis, which is instead of looking at, say, a small panel of cytokines, we can actually look at every single gene that's being expressed by, uh, by in tissues from these um, infected marmosets. Um, and what we can see, and this is uh, data that's uh, coming from blood, from whole blood from these marmosets, is that there's a very strong interferon signaling pathway response that is associated with Zika virus infection. Now, this is actually well known. It's well known that interferon signaling is involved in many viral infections, uh, ranging from flaviviruses like Zika, uh, like West Nile virus, to influenza virus. Um, but what, it was interesting to see, though, that, uh, that we could identify a signature, a host response, in this case, that would be um, hopefully predictive of Zika virus infection that could give us insights into how um, the virus is infecting uh, these monkeys. And this gives you an example of some of the insights that we can develop. So if you look at day three, for instance, you can see that much of what's being induced on a gene level is the type 1 interferon pathway. But if you look on day nine, you actually see that you actually see both type 2 and type 1. So type 1 is on the right, type 2 is on the left. Um, but you kind of see now induction of the type 2 interferon pathway. And that actually turns out to be um, significant uh, from a mechanistic standpoint because uh, it is, is now thought actually that in, in, non, in various non-human primates um, and in, the he, in human infections that the, the virus may actually inhibit parts of the type 1 pathway, meaning that what happens is that the virus uh, that the, that, that 
uh, perhaps that the, the, the human host response, or the in this case, the marmoset host response to the viral infection would have to go through a different pathway, which would be the type 2 pathway on the left. The other thing that we've shown um, also by doing these studies is that human placental trophoblasts appear to be permissive for Zika virus infection. Um, so uh, this was a study uh, that was done by my collaborator, Dr. Kirsty Agard, and you can see here that she was able to show that human placental trophoblasts, which are cells that are derived, the key cell in the placenta, in the human placenta, that they are infectable by Zika virus. Um, and similarly, we've been able to show uh, in marmosets that marmoset placental cells are also infectable. And there is now a kind of a growing hypothesis uh, among many groups that perhaps it's the placenta, uh, the maternal placenta in the mom that maintains the virus in the setting or maintains the viral infection or replication in the setting of a pregnancy. And it's possible that the placenta plays a critical role in maintaining the virus in pregnant women um, until the fetus is infected. Uh, so the, uh, the idea may be that if we could develop uh, a way to prevent or to mitigate placental infection, we might be able to prevent some of the consequences that are seen uh, with, say, microcephaly in uh, the children of um, Zika virus infected mothers. Uh, and we're currently doing work comparing, for instance, uh, the placental cells and their infective Infectability by Zika virus uh, among marmosets, among baboons, and among humans. Um, and I, sh I, th I think the take-home message is that all of these placental cell types, whether they come from monkeys or whether they come from humans, appear to be infectable and highly infectable by Zika virus. Um, I want to present also some very, very recent unpublished data showing um, congenital Zika virus infection in female marmosets. And the idea behind this is we want to demonstrate or replicate uh, kind of uh, Zika virus associated microcephaly, in this case in an animal model. Uh, so um, uh, in the interest of time, I won't go over the, the exact protocol here, but the general idea is that we uh, took two marmosets, female marmosets, pregnant female marmosets infected with Zika virus and followed them. Um, you know, unfortunately, fetal expulsion occurred uh, the, the, both of the, there's, there are miscarriages in both of these pregnancies. Uh, fetal explosion occurred about um, about 21 days um, after we inoculated these um, female pregnant monkeys with Zika virus. Um, one thing, though, that we did note is that um, in, 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 both the, um, in both of the fetuses uh, from these marmosets, we did note that you could detect the virus in, in, in pretty much multiple tissues. But the tissues are primarily um, they're the fetal tissues, placental tissues, and then some bodily secretions from the from the uh, from the from the mom, um, as well as um, from the dam, as well as um, in lymph nodes. And this shows you kind of the spectrum of the virus. So it, it seems to replicate what we see in male marmosets in that you can see persistence of the virus um, in urine and perhaps um, the, only of kind of viremia in the first week following infection. Uh, but notably, what we did see was that it appeared that there was congenital Zika virus infection in these female marmosets. You can see here that this is a view of, um, in this, uh, this is a view of kind of the fetal head and the fetus uh, from these um, uh, the miscarriages that occurred um, in these inoculated monkeys. But interestingly enough, the biparietal di diameter, which is the diameter uh, circumfer circumferential diameter of the head, uh, was actually 50% of that expected. And this is actually what we feel to be actually the first p potential de demonstration or demonstration of a potential uh, microcephaly in a non-human primate or monkey model. Uh, that may be attributed, hopefully attributed to Zika virus infection. Now, this was actually only uh, two cases, and we're currently doing um, kind of further uh, studies to uh, try to uh, confirm or to replicate, reproduce these results. And then finally, I want to go into uh, the fact that we're also um, interested in looking at the virus uh, by studying these uh, non-human primate models. So we're working with Dr. Lark Coffey and Cohen Ron Rompe at UC Davis they have a re separate rhesus macaque model of Zika virus infection. And interestingly enough, what we've noted in their model is that there was a mutation that appeared to be induced by inoculating these rhesus macaques with this virus. Um, and interestingly enough, this mutation is actually um, uh, was seen in, in only in mothers or fetuses who were infected, uh, whose fetuses died as a result of the infection. Um, and what's interesting is that this particular mutation 
has also been seen in human cases of actual Zika virus microcephaly, induced microcephaly, uh, that have been described in, such as in this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. When they sequenced the virus from this uh, mom, this human um, uh, mom with who had a child with microcephaly, uh, they actually found that that virus had the exact same mutation as the mutation that we see in the, the rhesus macaque model. And this is actually highly, uh, very exciting data because it really suggests to us that there may be a possibility that there may be specific mutations or variants of the virus that may be linked to or may be causative of microcephaly. I want to end by uh, talking about uh, briefly about our efforts to do metagenomic surveillance of Zika virus infection. So my laboratory is interested in what we call metagenomic next generation sequencing. This is a very broad approach. We're actually taking a fishnet and the idea is to, instead of typical ways of diagnosing infections by looking for one target at a time, we want to take a huge fishnet and be able to capture the entire spectrum of organisms that cause infectious diseases in a single test or a single assay. And it's based on the principle that all microbes, bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites can be uniquely identified by their DNA or RNA. Uh, in the principle, there's no particular reason why we can simply implement a single test to identify all of these uh, microbes that cause infectious diseases. And what's made this approach possible over the past couple of years have been the development of pipelines uh, by several groups. Uh, we have this uh, SERPI pipeline that was developed in my laboratory that can enable us to analyze, say, 100 million, 200 million, 300 million sequence reads within two hours and be able to then determine whether there are any pathogens or read sequencing reads to pathogens that, that, that cause infectious diseases in clinical samples. We've actually developed a clinical workflow in the laboratory and we actually are running a, a, a clinical test now based on metagenomic sequencing that can detect all viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites um, in a single test. Uh, this is for the purposes of, of diagnosing meningitis and encephalitis from spinal fluid, although we're developing currently clinically validating this test for other indications. So I want to talk specifically of how we've applied this technique, metagenomic sequencing. The general idea is that you want to take a clinical sample, blood, saliva, um, respiratory secretions, urine, and be able to sequence all of the DNA and RNA in that sample, be able to then identify non-human reads that may correspond to potential pathogens. Now, uh, we've developed a method that we can couple this metagenomic approach with doing specific enrichment for Zika virus. And by doing so, the idea is that we might be able to not only detect Zika virus, but be able to assemble the entire genome of the virus. And we've been able to show, for instance, uh, these are actual cases from uh, Bahia, Brazil, of Zika virus infection, where although we have very low titers of the virus, we can still recover most, uh, if not all, of the genome by using these techniques. And we were able to, uh, to use this or apply this in the case of Bahia, Brazil, where we identified that there was a specific circulating strain in Bahia, Brazil, identified using metagenomic sequencing with enrichment. We identified one strain, as you can see there, which is colored in, in sort of the pinkish color. There's one clade or one group of the virus that appeared to be inherent to Bahia, Brazil. Um, this was only identifiable by the use of whole genome sequencing and metagenomic sequencing. Notably, uh, Bahia, Brazil is, is an interesting state because that, that, that actually is a province in Brazil that is most affected by microsica-associated microcephaly. In fact, this is the province within Brazil that reported the greatest number of cases of microcephaly. And as you can see here, um, we, uh, the first case of, of, uh, of this uh, of Zika virus associated microcephaly was actually reported in early 2015. Um, and um, and you can see there that it actually correlates very well, if you look at a previous slide, with the emergence of the virus occurring in 2014. So by the use of essentially genomic sequencing of the virus, we were able to basically track how the virus emerged in Bahia, Brazil, and also um, how it became apparent that uh, the virus was associated with cases of microcephaly in humans. Um, I want to go into some other uh, applications of using metagenomic sequencing. One idea behind metagenomic sequencing is that you can do what we call transcriptome analysis. I mean, this is a very powerful approach where we actually look at human gene expression in response to infections such as by Zika virus. And our hypothesis here is that the transcriptome of Zika virus patients can help us identify blood biomarkers. 
that might be able to uh, be predictive of not only microcephaly but also Guillain-Barre syndrome. And we could perhaps develop this as a diagnostic test. Um, this has actually been shown that perhaps that we might be able to adopt our lessons from Lyme disease. We're currently actually working on a separate project by Dr. Uh, Jerome Bouquet, a postdoc in my laboratory, on developing a panel that can diagnose Lyme disease uh, by the use of looking at the host response. Now, this is a novel approach because we're not trying to diagnose a disease by detecting the pathogen or pathogenucleic acid. We're actually diagnosing the disease by looking at the specific pattern of human genes in response to that infection. And is it specific enough so that we could diagnose that disease? Um, we'd be able to show, for instance, by just looking at human host response, we can develop a panel for Lyme disease diagnosis that has very good performance, sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. Currently, this is in development as a clinical test for acute Lyme disease. And we want to apply this now to a Zika virus infection because it would be great if we, for instance, could develop a test that could help the prognostic and help us determine, you know, whether or not a woman is infected with Zika virus, whether or not she has, she, her infected baby is at risk of developing, you know, Zika virus infection or whether, uh, Zika virus infection of microcephaly and or whether or not a, a patients are at risk of developing severe disease or outcomes from Zika virus infection. Um, and I want to talk very briefly about some of the clinical samples we analyzed today. We actually looked and we identified some differentially expressed genes as a result. And uh, notably, one of the genes actually was related to, was a neurological gene that's only found in neurons. And this is work which is currently ongoing. Uh, but it's our hope that we may, it may yield some insights into developing new diagnostics for Zika virus infection. Um, I want to end by talking about some very exciting work that we're doing on differential diagnosis of tropical febrile illnesses, um, and which includes Zika virus. And one of the challenges for us when we're trying to diagnose infections in the tropics is that the same clinical syndrome can be replicated that can be seen in a variety of different infections, whether they're bacterial, whether they're viral, or whether they're other, or even non-infectious. And one of the, the other challenge that's focused specifically with Zika virus is that titers of Zika virus are, tend to be very, very low in the setting of acute infection. So what you can see is on the left with Ebola virus, the cycle thresholds are very low, meaning that the titers in infected people or the loads in infected people are very high. Uh, that's the case for Ebola. For Zika virus, the titers are low. So what we've done is we've actually coupled the use of metagenomic detection to detect everything, but we've been able to add specific targets, targeted primers to increase sensitivity. So the idea behind this is we want to be able to enrich these metagenomic libraries to be able to detect something like Zika virus with very, very high sensitivity, but at the same time we don't sacrifice the ability to detect off-target uh, targets like in this case HIV. And we've been able to show that this approach can actually enable us to get a sensitivity almost comparable or equivalent to direct PCR testing for Zika virus. And we can get very high coverage. In some cases, we can recover the entire genome, as you can see here. This is where we're, I'm, now, I'm mapping raw metagenomic sequencing reads onto the viral genome of Zika virus. We've actually also been able to use this to actually, in a manuscript preparation, to describe, for instance, by doing whole genome sequencing from low titer samples on how the virus is spreading and evolving um, in Mexico and in Central America. So this is a brief summary of viral genome sequencing. Uh, we've adopted the spiked-in primer technique, which is cheap and fast and easy to do. Um, it's, it, it tends to be, have many advantages. And I finally want to end by the very last thing is we want to apply this technique to be able to diagnose in real time pathogens in the setting of febrile illness, including Zika virus. And this is done with Dr. Wayne Dang, a postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory. So what we've done is we actually use what we call the MinION sequencer, which actually is a sequencer which is pocket sized, powered by the USB port in your laptop. And essentially what you can do is sequencing on the fly using this instrument. We're able to actually take a blood sample and actually go from a sample to processing it to sequencing and getting an answer in under three hours. Uh, so potentially this may be a test that will enable us to identify essentially all organisms within three hours from clinical samples. Uh, we published some data suggesting that we could, for instance, identify chikungunya virus on the left and Ebola virus on the right within six and eight minutes of starting sequencing. And what I show you here is, is a brief video showing how we have actually been able to apply this to Zika virus. 
So what you're seeing here is I'm actually starting the sequencing run. This is a blood sample uh, from a, a sample that's infected with that has HIV and Zika virus in it. We can detect HIV and we can also detect Zika virus at a lower titer using uh, within essentially 15 minutes of starting sequencing. So nanopore sequencing, it does have several advantages, um, and I've already mentioned most of them. It's portable, it's pocket size. We can sequence RNA, potentially in addition to DNA. Um, potentially, there are very fast turnaround times. We could use these in the field. And in fact, we've actually deployed some of these nanopore sequencers to Brazil and to Mexico to do Zika virus sequencing. Uh, the costs of the sequencing tend to still be high and the error rates are still high, uh, so these may be potential disadvantages before we can sort of see these technologies being used routinely in clinical setting. I want to end by acknowledging uh, the multiple research collaborators and scientists uh, who have worked with me on this. Uh, they include members of my laboratory, um, including, they're listed there, uh, support from Abbott Diagnostics. Uh, we work at the University of California Davis, Lark Coffey and Colin Van Rampe on the Rhesus Macaque Model, Texas Biomedical Research Institute and Baylor School of Medicine um, on uh, Marmoset Model of Zika Virus Infection, the University of Oxford on, on Zika Virus Genome Sequencing and Analysis, the California Department of Public Health on uh, Investigation of Outbreaks, uh, Mexico, the National Autonomous University of Mexico on studying uh, Zika virus uh, evolution as, as well as uh, collaborators in Barbados and Brazil. And finally, I would like to acknowledge funding for my research, which includes funding from the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, as well as from Abbott Laboratories. Thank you very much, and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Chu, for that informative presentation. It's time for Q&A. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. If we are unable to get to your question, we will follow up with you via email after the presentation. Let's get started. Our first question is, what are the most significant questions remaining regarding Zika virus? So that is a great question. What, what, are, what are kind of the challenges that are remaining involving Zika virus? Well, there's so much about the virus we don't understand. Um, you know, we, we don't really understand uh, why is it that some uh, patients uh, pregnant women who are infected with Zika virus um, actually have babies who have microcephaly, um, although th this association has now been proven and confirmed. We don't know what, what is the risk of microcephaly in a, in a pregnant woman who is infected with Zika virus. Uh, we st still don't understand the risk of, uh, similarly, the risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome in a, in a patient who is infected with Zika virus. Um, uh, we don't really uh, understand um, kind of the mechanism of sexual transmission of, of Zika virus. Why is it that this is uh, among all flavivirus appears to be the only virus that appears to be sexually transmitted? Um, and, I would, and I think what's really lacking with Zika virus is that we really lack an effective vaccine, which is what we really need to prevent these infections ultimately, as well as uh, potential treatments or, or, or therapeutics that might be used to either prevent or to mitigate um, some of these consequences of Zika virus infection. And really what is really needed is kind of a broad-based approach which involves both cell culture, uh, understanding kind of the basic virology of the virus, um, animal models that could be used such as mouse models and non-human primate models such as a marmoset model I, I previously talked about that could be used um, to, um, to, to develop and test drugs and vaccines, candidate drugs and vaccines, um, as well as better ways to diagnose the disease and to follow patients um, who are infected with the virus. Thank you. The next question is, why aren't we seeing ongoing cases of Zika in previous countries affected by the outbreak? This is a very interesting question. Um, it, it, is well, it is now well described, the, for instance, that we are seeing very, very few cases in Brazil, 
Uh, we're seeing uh, very, very few cases in, in areas that have previously been essentially severely affected by the Zika virus outbreak, like Puerto Rico, for instance, uh, where much of the population may have been exposed to the virus. So whereas in, in um, 2014, 2015, there were thousands of cases in Brazil, right now we're only seeing a handful of cases in these locations. Now, we don't really know the, the actual answer to this, um, although it has been speculated, and I think there is some data to support this, that um, there may be a, a, what we call herd immunity effect, meaning that um, patients uh, in these exposed areas or individuals in these uh, exposed population have already been um, exposed to the virus and therefore have developed an immunity, so are uh, less likely to see cases of transmission um, if they are already immune. Um, I, I do have to stress, however, that it is unknown whether or not kind of repeat infection from Zika virus will help, uh, will prevent, uh, is possible, or whether or not it will, it will prevent um, any of the, con of the downstream consequences of Zika virus infection, which is why um, I still feel that um, efforts to develop uh, drugs or vaccines to prevent infection in the first place are, are still needed. Thank you. We'll wrap up with one more question, and that question is, what kind of diagnostics are needed for this developing world in preparation for outbreaks such as Zika virus? That's a great question, and that's a great question. And what we really need uh, for uh, new diagnostics for dealing with kind of these new outbreaks we need broad-based diagnostics that can really detect all types of organisms that cause these diseases. Um, it's not just viruses that cause disease, although viral outbreaks have probably received the most publicity. Uh, there have been cases of, say, bacterial outbreaks. Uh, there was actually recently described um, an ongoing case, uh, cases of a new fungal pathogen called Candida auris, which has caused several hospital associate outbreaks throughout the United States, which is an ongoing kind of outbreak situation that's being monitored by the Centers for Disease Control. Um, so what we really need are for, for doing this kind of uh, surveillance or being able to develop diagnostic tests for, for identifying outbreak we, is, is we need tests that can identify the full spectrum of infe uh, infectious pathogens that can cause these outbreaks. In other words, we need a test that can detect all viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites, you know, of which perhaps a metagenomic test might be a, a suitable candidate for doing so. Um, in addition, we need to have um, a, a test that could potentially detect uh, organisms or protect, detect sequences from organisms that are potentially novel. Um, it's been well described that many of these, um, many of these uh, emerging outbreak pathogens, um, they either have, uh, have they're either, um, they either arise from animals or they haven't been, or they're uncommon or they haven't been described very well uh, in the past and they haven't been characterized very well. And as a result, what you really need is you want a broad-based, unbiased uh, diagnostic test that could detect not only known pathogens or well-characterized pathogens, but also kind of these novel pathogens. Um, a good example of, of a novel pathogen would be something like SARS coronavirus, which was a coronavirus strain that had previously not been appreciated as causing infections in humans, but which was responsible for a, a, a global outbreak um, you know, several years ago. Um, so what we really need is we, uh, we think we need uh, probably broad-based diagnostic tests that can detect the full spectrum of pathogens, um, as well as tests that could be applied in the point of care, sort of directly in pandemic hotspots, so that diagnosis can be made quickly and interventions, public health and infection control interventions could be instituted immediately. Um, and in that way, hopefully be able to either prevent or mitigate the spread of a potential outbreak. Thank you once again, Dr. Chu. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 14, 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.